Hello, High Rock. Some of you are watching this because you're traveling for the weekend, and others because there's just too much snow to make it to church. Either way, I'm glad we get to open up the scriptures together while you're snuggled at home. I'm going to begin today by reading our scripture, and that's going to be from Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 24. You can read along with me in your own Bible, or you can just close your eyes and listen as I read it. Again, Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 24. This is the interpretation, Your Majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against the Lord my King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms on earth and He gives them to anyone He wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you know that one of my kids was seriously sick recently, and we spent more than a week in the hospital with him. Thankfully, he's going to be okay. But we discovered there's a reason they call people in hospitals patients, because most of the time they were spent waiting. My son was mostly sleeping, so I confess that during those long hours of Waiting by myself, I developed an unhealthy addiction to talent show videos on YouTube. I wasted hours watching auditions for America's Got Talent and Britain's Got Talent and Croatia's Got Talent, X Factor, The Voice, all of them. I started with the winners, then all of the golden buzzers, but eventually I started watching all the initial auditions, which were entertaining in a very different way. All of the finalists were phenomenal. But a lot of the auditions were from people who had no business being there. It was so cringy, it was hilarious. But before each audition, the judges often asked, What's your dream? Invariably, the answer was some version of, I want to be rich, famous, and sell more albums than the Beatles. A lot of us recognize that desire. Maybe at some point we wanted to be sports stars, celebrities, or the president. When it was clear that that wouldn't pan out, some of us traded for fantasies of epic success in our careers. I want to start a great company, or find a cure for cancer. I want to write an important book, invent something awesome, create beautiful art, become an Instagram influencer, or simply become rich. But while the value of success in any of those areas is obvious, we don't often dis cons consider the dangers. VH1 created a new TV genre years ago with shows like Where Are They Now? that let us delight in the demise of the one-hit wonders, child stars, and sports heroes we used to envy. It highlighted their drug addictions, and divorces, and band breakups, and bankruptcies. Today, people love to criticize Bill Cosby, laugh about Pete Davidson, discover what a jerk Steve Jobs was, and hear about lottery winners gone broke. It's become almost axiomatic that too much success can ruin people. And yet, we long for more success anyway. Do you know anyone who was ruined by success? Almost all of us do. Someone who suddenly came into money, 
authority or success, and suddenly they changed. They left their spouse, they forgot their friends, they forgot their faith. Many of you have been successful in various ways. How has success changed you? Recently, my son told me that one of his friends and fellow waiters was promoted to assistant manager. Now, that's still pretty low on the totem pole. But suddenly, he started bossing everyone around and making new policies and taking privileges for himself beyond what's allowed. That small amount of power went to his head. So in just a few weeks, he's lost all his friends and he's in jeopardy of losing his job. Power and fame often change people and very rarely for the better. Many of us learn how to handle pain, but few of us know how to handle fame. Of course, some people experience success, and if anything, they become more gracious, more thankful, more thoughtful of others. So maybe success doesn't change people as much as it reveals who they really are, which is why God so often tests us before he trusts us with more. We see this clearly in Luke 16, where Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? By contrast, in the parable of the talents, Jesus promises that the person who's faithful with a few things will be put in charge of more. So what makes some people able to handle success while others are ruined by it? It turns out that there's a spiritual ingredient required to make us safe being successful. And we can learn about that spiritual ingredient in our passage today from Daniel chapter 4, which is, was written not by Daniel, but by one of the most successful people in history. King Nebuchadnezzar was the whole package. He'd started as a young general in his father's army, and he rose to fame when he single-handedly defeated the Assyrian Empire, which had been the mightiest military in the world until then. It was a stunning upset that made him an instant hero. When his father died, Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon, and he expanded the empire until it became the most powerful on the planet. Babylon was also considered the most beautiful city in the world, the centerpiece of which was Babylon's famous Hanging Gardens, designed by Nebuchadnezzar. It's listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world on par with Egypt's pyramids. Everyone was so impressed, including Nebuchadnezzar, who had a 90-foot statue of himself built out of gold so that everyone would worship it. Well, when Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down, they were threatened with being thrown into the fiery furnace to die. But in an amazing story, they replied calmly, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Well, it turns out that God did save them, and Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed by their faith and by God's miraculous power that he began to praise God too. Nebuchadnezzar had been changed by an encounter with God. But not for very long, because remember, there's a spiritual ingredient needed to be safe with success. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't have it. As impressed as he was by the Lord, he was still pretty impressed with himself. For another 30 years, Nebuchadnezzar keeps hearing more about God from Daniel, but keeps worshiping himself. All that success had made him self-centered. Maybe that's your story too. But after patiently waiting for 30 years, finally God had had enough. So the Lord warned Nebuchadnezzar in a disturbing dream that Daniel interpreted. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. God threatened that if Nebuchadnezzar continued to be so arrogant, he was going to lose not only his kingdom, 
but his home, his relationships, even his sanity, left living like a wild animal, until he finally acknowledged that God is the true king over everything, who is the source of our success. He gave us our, our gifts and opportunities and personalities. This was a dire warning. So Daniel begged the king not to let this happen. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. Then your prosperity will continue. Three things Nebuchadnezzar needs to do. Renounce his sins of arrogance and pride. Do what's right. And be kind to the oppressed. Those are God's simple instructions to Nebuchadnezzar. And they sound very much like the simple instructions God gave to all of us in Micah 6.8. What does the Lord God require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. God asks us to love Him and to love others. As you think about your response to the Me Too movement, the incarceration crisis, refugees, or poverty, know that God takes personally how we treat minorities and the marginalized. They're His precious children. So we love Him by loving them. We read in Proverbs 14, Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Sometimes people ask me why God isn't doing more to help the poor, orphans, and refugees around the world. And I can only imagine God replying, uh, Huh? I gave most of the world's wealth to people who claim to follow me. And I instructed them to use it to help people. So the real question is, why aren't you doing more to help the poor and the orphans and the refugees? God gives us gifts in different areas for a reason. And the reason isn't just to bless you, it's to equip you to bless others. God gives you the privilege of playing a part in that. And yet some of us use those gifts God gave us mostly to serve ourselves. Like some of you, Nebuchadnezzar had been entrusted with exceptional gifts, but was hoarding them for himself. And after warning Nebuchadnezzar again, God gave him one more year. Until one afternoon, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Do you hear all those personal pronouns? I have built my mighty power, my majesty. Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed with all that he'd accomplished, but gave God and others no credit at all. And God had finally had it. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and you'll live with wild animals until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar was reduced from being the most powerful person on the planet to someone who was homeless, mentally ill, and living alone in the wilderness. We hear similar stories today, maybe a little less dramatic, but it's that same dynamic. My success is nothing compared to Nebuchadnezzar's, and yet even I'm sometimes enticed by pride. Because of my job, I'm often at the center of attention, and crowds gather to hear what I say. People who don't know me very well assume I'm, I'm so holy. Then God does something miraculous in people, and some of them attribute it to me. And I so want to believe that's true. But my success is relatively small, so I can only imagine what it must be like to be on a, a national or international stage with people constantly cheering for you and fawning over you or seeking your attention. It would be easy to forget who you really are and aren't. When we keep hearing compliments, when people keep focusing on us, it's hard not to join them and become suffocatingly self-centered. You know, I've heard that compliments are like chewing gum. Chew on it for a while, 
never swallow it because it'll make you sick. So I understand why we've seen so many famous politicians and movie stars and sports stars and CEOs and mega church pastors ruined by their pride. They lose their marriages, their money, their careers. <laughs> Sometimes they seem to lose their minds. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar after he started to believe his own press releases. Well, that could have been the end of a very tragic story, but it wasn't. And this should give us hope. Because remember, Daniel chapter 4 is actually written by Nebuchadnezzar after this painful episode as a joyful testimony broadcast to the whole world of the way God ultimately rescued him from pride and restored him to his throne. His letter began, To the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, it's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. Then he starts telling the story of the stumble it took to make him humble. But Nebuchadnezzar can write this because after God decided he was finally ready to handle success, God restored everything that was lost, his sanity and his throne. Nebuchadnezzar could only be king when he recognized that he's the servant of a much greater king. So the spiritual ingredient Nebuchadnezzar discovered and that we need to handle success in a way that makes it a blessing rather than a curse is humility. Well, some of you hear that and you inwardly groan because you know that humility is something you struggle with. Others of you are thinking, Humility? <laughs> I got that in spades. I'm so humble, I, I practically hate myself. I, I hate the way I look I, and the stupid things I say. I, I hate that I'm not more accomplished or more attractive or more intelligent or more holy. I stink. So check, I, I got lots of humility. Uh, but that's not humility. It's just another form of pride. Usually, we assume that a proud person considers him or herself better than others, more valuable, intelligent, more spiritual or successful, more popular, more wealthy, more attractive, a better parent, a better person, or, or something else. Sometimes I indulge in that kind of pride, as do some of you. Sometimes I've judged others who I perceive to be less skilled, less smart or spiritual than I am. Sometimes. I even judge those I perceive to be more prideful than I am. But more often, I experience the other side of pride, as do many of you. The side of pride that we may not recognize as pride at all. I feel inadequate. I feel insecure. I feel less intelligent or gifted or attractive than others. As a pastor, my insecurity shows up as envy of those who are better preachers better leaders, or have bigger churches. I'm jealous of those who've been given abilities or opportunities I've wanted for myself. Much more often than I've judged others, I've judged myself as a failure and a fraud. And in my heart, I fantasize about ways I could prove myself and become important. And although it may not seem so at first, that's the very essence of pride. Prideful people decide for themselves what makes people worthwhile? They assume God's role as creator and judge so they can determine what makes a person valuable. Pride doesn't necessarily mean that I think I'm better than someone else, but is the arrogant assumption that I get to decide who's better. I appoint myself judge over what God has created. And we all do this from time to time, flipping back and forth between thinking that we're fantastic and thinking that we're failures. But like Nebuchadnezzar, we lack true humility because most of us don't even know what that is. A few years after we started High Rock, someone wrote an angry email to a large group excoriating my lack of humility. Immediately, I, I thought of examples proving how much more humble I was than he. But I soon realized I mean, he's right. Even if the way he said it wasn't helpful, what he said was true. I am prideful, but I didn't know what to do about it. So I read a bunch of books on humility, which didn't immediately, immediately make me more humble, but helped me see what humility is. And that's what I hope to share with you today. 
Turns out that despite the popular perception, humility is not insecurity or low self-esteem. Those are both expressions of pride. Humility is not hiding your talents or, or pretending you're not really skilled at something when you clearly are. That's false humility and dishonesty. Humility is not passivity, becoming a doormat. Jesus and the Apostle Paul were both humble, but neither were pushovers. Right? They were bold and assertive. In fact, we can assume that since God wants to make a great impact on the world and also commands us to be humble, truly humble people would make a great impact on the world. The word humility is derived from the same root as the word human is. Humus, which means dirt. Humility begins by realizing that we're dirt. In Genesis, we read that God formed humans out of dirt. The name Adam is derived from Adama, the Hebrew word for dirt. If you're watching this video with somebody else, I want you to turn right now to that other person and tell him or her, you're dirt. Really, do that right now. Well, that might sound discouraging, but Isaiah reminds us that we're dirt that's been shaped into something special by God. We're clay, dirt, humus, but you are the potter. We're the work of your hand. Every Ash Wednesday, we smear ashes on your head and we remind you from dust you came and to dust you will return. You're just dirt. Well, not just dirt. You're dirt that God shaped just the way he wanted in order to accomplish what he wanted. The key to humility is to recognize that we're all dirt, right? Presidents, peasants, pastors, movie stars, millionaires, and moms, we're all dirt. But we're dirt that's been carefully crafted by God. Just as he formed Adam, God formed me the way he wanted so that I could serve him and serve others the way he wanted me to. The fact that I, I might have certain skills or smarts or spiritual gifts that others don't doesn't mean that I'm better than they are or worse when it's the other way around. It just means that I've been designed to serve God in a different way. My value doesn't derive from what God created me to do, but from who created me to do it. When we lose sight of that, we pridefully start deciding which dirt is better. And as a result, we humans tend to boast about the dumbest stuff. I knew a very arrogant doctor years ago who thought himself above others. But I thought, well, you stick your hands in people's backsides and you study their stool. I mean, the, the janitors and bus drivers you look down on would probably struggle to stoop that low. God made us different, but God made us. That's why we're so valuable. So me boasting about my particular attributes or opportunities would be as stupid as the mud shaped into a fancy dinner plate that's only used on special occasions, boasting over the mud shaped into a sturdier plate that's used every day. One's not better than the other. They're both perfect for a particular use. But both are made out of mud. Each week in this Daniel series, we're looking at a lie that threatens to devour us like a lion. And this week's lie is, I am more if I have more or can do more. But the truth is that God has a different purpose for each of us. But our value is the same. So the Apostle Paul challenges, who makes you different from anybody else? Well, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Paul's saying, some of you think you're, you're so superior or inferior to others. Get over yourselves. You're all mud that's been temporarily formed into different shapes so that God could reflect his whole image to the world and get all his work done. You didn't decide what gifts or limits you'd have, what parents you'd have, what place you'd be born, or the good and bad circumstances of your life. You don't even get to decide what is good or bad. It's not about you. It's about God. And this means that I'm not special because I'm the senior pastor, and you're not special if 
you're a CEO or a PhD. Nebuchadnezzar's not special because he defeated the Assyrians or because he's king. He's special because even though he's only dirt, he's dirt that's been designed by God for a purpose. Paul agrees in Ephesians, we're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Nebuchadnezzar's job then, and ours, is simply to be who God created him to be. Be himself for others. This is the essence of humility. To realize that I'm dirt, just like everybody else, no better and no worse like everyone else. I'm dirt that was fashioned by God for a particular purpose. And that makes every compliment we receive another test. Proverbs 27, 21 says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by being praised. Will that praise lead to pride, as I take it personally, or will it cause me to, to join that person in praising what God has made? As you look at yourself, what can you praise God for? What great things has the Lord built into you as a way of blessing others? God makes amazing things out of dirt. How's that true of you? Well, some of you would feel awkward answering that out loud, but that's not humility. It's false humility, which is a form of pride. God made you. God had a purpose, and God did a good job. Humble people are not insecure, but indeed are the most secure, because they know who they are, and whose they are, and why they're here. Liberated from the burden of being God or becoming someone else, they're free to serve others and just be themselves. And this is a challenge for all of us. Because so often, my pride turns my eyes inward, convincing me that I want to be something or someone else. I want to be more important or more gifted or more attractive or more effective. But when I stand before the Lord at the end of the age, I'll not be asked, why weren't you Tim Keller or Andy Stanley? You engineers and business people will not be asked, why weren't you Bill Gates or Elon Musk? You scientists will not be asked, why weren't you Stephen Hawking? You doctors will not be asked, why weren't you Paul Brand? You nurses and social workers will not be asked, why weren't you Mother Teresa? I'll be asked, why weren't you Dave Swain? Why weren't you willing to be who I created you to be? Why did you try so hard to be someone else? Why did you try to prove you were special when I made you special already? Why were you not Dave Swain? like I created you to be. And God will ask you why you weren't yourself. Why did you try to recreate yourself in someone else's image when God already designed you to reflect His? And the answer will be that we weren't humble enough to be ourselves. When we're truly humble, we're no longer so desperate for what the world calls success because that no longer defines us. And only then can God trust us with worldly success. The Bible talks about humility from end to end, but of course the best example of humility is Jesus. Because he didn't consider equality with God to be something, you know, something to be grasped, you know, held on to, protected at all costs. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He was fashioned out of the dirt that he'd made. That's humility. I mean, just imagine Jesus having to be a helpless infant or obey his parents and teachers whom he created. Jesus could have demanded glory, but he had the humility to be exactly what his heavenly father called him to be. He was a servant. And then Jesus was willing to be crucified to save the people who pridefully tried to live without him. That's humility. So what should we do with all of this? Paul suggests, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, 
then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Paul's inviting us to follow Jesus. How then can we become truly humble? First, we'll have a much easier time remembering who we are if we begin and end each day by focusing on who God is. Because we were created in His image. That's why so many of us begin and end each day with prayer. We can never experience true humility unless we realize there's one God who creates everything and deserves to be honored by everyone, and you are not him. Ernst Kurtz wrote a book about Alcoholics Anonymous entitled Not God, because he says the fundamental problem alcoholics have is that they live under the delusion that they're in control of everything, when in fact, they can't even control themselves. So at recovery meetings, the first thing people say is, Hi, my name is Dave. And I'm an alcoholic, which is to admit from the outset, I'm not God. I have weaknesses and limitations. I'm not in control of everything. Someone once said the, the biggest difference between you and God is that God doesn't think he's you. The second way we can defeat our pride is by thinking more about others and less about ourselves. You've probably heard the old adage that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. If I walk into a crowded room and the first thing I think is, how do I look? Or, ooh, I don't deserve to be here. That's pride. I'm thinking about myself. But if I walk into a crowded room and the first thing I think is, who needs help? That's humility. This is why Daniel compelled Nebuchadnezzar to care for the oppressed. Serving others is the easiest way to get our eyes off ourselves and, ironically, Discover what God created us for. This is the value of so many mission trips. I say, don't vacation to resort. I don't need somebody calling me sir and waiting on me hand and foot. That's only going to make me more self-centered. My goodness, it's my self-centeredness that's exhausting me. I say instead, vacation to a refugee camp or an orphanage. Go serve somewhere. My family has done this and come back more refreshed, more renewed, more in touch with reality more thankful to God, and more captivated by His mission. We can defeat our pride by getting our eyes off ourselves. And this leads to the third suggestion. Daniel also told Nebuchadnezzar to repent. That means just change your mind. Stop thinking about yourself so much and develop humility. You know, the Bible never tells us to pray for God to humble us. Instead, many times, it commands us to humble ourselves. If you refuse to humble yourself, eventually God will humble you, like he did to Nebuchadnezzar. But then we call it humiliation. Same root word, but less pleasant. We've seen that story in our headlines a million times. Bill Clinton, Tiger Woods, Kevin Spacey, Jimmy Swaggart. Peter tells us, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. That's what Nebuchadnezzar finally did. But I don't want it to take you seven years like it took him, and I don't want you to wait for God to humiliate you. So today, we've made up a list of some simple questions and suggestions that can help you humble yourself. You're going to find that they're on our blog page or our website. You can get them on the page where you, you downloaded this sermon. We'll also have them on the High Rock app. You could use them this week in your quiet times or, or perhaps discuss them with your family or your roommate. You know, I still have a long way to go in developing humility. But by God's grace, I'm slowly growing in this area. God keeps teaching me that He's God and I'm not. So I can go back to just being Dave. How about you? What would humility look like in your life? 
Has God tested you with success? How'd you do? Friends, earlier I said that you're dirt. And some of you called each other dirt. You are dirt. But your dirt, designed to reflect God's image and accomplish God's purposes, you are loved. You are valued. You're small, but you're precious. You're God's workmanship, created to do good things that he prepared in advance for you to do.